Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Express Entry Live Q&A. I am your host, Mark Holfe, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, yes, for Canada, and former high school teacher. And I've taken all these and combined them together to do what I love most, which is teach about immigration in the legal industry. Thanks so much for joining, and it's great to have all of you here. We're broadcasting through YouTube, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, I think is connected still. And uh, this is your opportunity to get your questions answered about immigration. Now, the one that's probably driving most of people crazy is, is this last two-week period or so where we were suffering from this right here, which is the labor disruption at IRCC. Fortunately, you can see right here that the Government of Canada and PSAC, the Union for the Public Service folks, reached a tentative agreement ending the strike effective, um, effectively, uh, you know, that was, that was preventing your officers from processing your applications. And so they say there may still be some service impacts as they return to full capacity, but fortunately it did not last long and we are so, so happy because of this. So all these, in, in, like right here, you can see these are all of the various services that were impacted. And so what does that mean? You should expect delays as we return to service standards. What are they? You can see A tips. So they didn't do, <laughs> they didn't, weren't responding to those. Biometrics offices were being closed. Citizenship events weren't happening. Consular citizenship and passport services were affected. Trying to contact IRCC, that's why you weren't getting any of your web forms responded to or anything like that. Uh, applying to extend your stay in Canada, well, those processing times, you wait. We'll see. I don't think they've updated them yet, but let's just see if they've uh, tried to... Nope, they haven't because I can see that this link hasn't been changed. So the processing times, let's go for work permit extensions inside Canada. That's a good place to start. Um, ex extensions inside Canada. Let's see. You can see here. Oh, they did. All right. Now you can see the full effect of the insanity. So May the 2nd, they just updated this yesterday. So the processing times you can see obviously are, are affected 134 days here. Let's go and let's see what this looks like for um, express entry. See if there was any adjustments to this. So let's go with the Canadian experience class. And let's see. Oh, okay. Well, looks like they feel there wasn't a marked uh, effect on these because these processing times haven't changed much. Let's go with family sponsorship. You guys are going to ask about all this anyway, so I might as well bring it up. Um, so spouse common law partner inside Canada. Okay, that's at 14 months. Now that, I believe, was lower before the changeover. And then let's pull up the uh, outside of Canada sponsorship and see what that is sitting at. 16. Okay, it's not not horrible. We've seen these processing times actually start to come down a little bit for these areas. So yes, indeed, the lovely strike, the labor disruption had affected the extension of applications, grants and contributions, um, immigration related appointments, passport services, processing applications, limited capacity during the strike, which we can see. So ultimately, um, I'm very, very grateful that it was not like the pandemic where we were basically shut down because of the border restrictions and the border closures for months on end. You know, we've taken, what, three years to climb our way out of that. So I'm very happy that the government and PSAC was able to come to an agreement this week and that they're now heading back to normal processing. So I know you guys had lots of questions about that. So I wanted to hit on that right off the bat. Okay, make sure that you are posting where you're from. I want to hear where you're from, where you're tuning in from. And uh, and yes, we'll be back tomorrow. Alicia at noon, she'll be joining me. But this is all about express entry and answering your questions. Okay, a couple other things, uh, little highlights. Um, let me just see here. Actually, let's do some shout outs first. So I know that some of you have questions like Dana here. What does it mean when background checks is changed to not applicable in the GC key account? Um, I have no clue what that would mean, Dana. I have no clue, Dana. Um, the ultimately, uh, <laughs> background checks are always applicable. So I don't know what that uh, ultimately would refer to. Okay, let's see here. Um, Santa says, I'm here again with a question. All right, so we'll see what Santa's question ultimately is. 
Uh, Anna says, hello, you look good, Mark. Thanks. We've got a, a new kind of view here. So there we go. We've got the statues. We've got a bunch of stuff. I've got a nice uh, swivel chair here that allows me to to get a little bit more mobility and I have the ability to raise this desk up too, which is awesome. All right, so welcome Anna, thank you for connecting in. And uh, we'll get to the questions in just a bit, so make sure you post where you're tuning in from. Yes, Anna is over in Mexico, that's great and huge. Oh, great Merv, thanks for connecting in. We know that LinkedIn is connected, so fantastic to have you joining us today. Uh, let's see who else we have here. Oh, we also have uh, Casey here, uh, who's on Facebook. So we've got a good mix of people. Um, let's start with uh, firing off and answering a few questions. Good morning. What are the criteria for transferring legal or law state licenses as in stenographer court reporting? Well, each, um, each occupation in Canada is either regulated or non-regulated. And when it comes to stenographers, um, I'm unfamiliar with that organization within Alberta within each of the provinces, but it depends on which province you go to, Casey. You have to see if there's any regulatory requirements, if it's a, a regulated industry. But one way that you can also go, obviously search for that working in that occupation, but I'll, I'll show you. Let's slide over here and I'll give you a few more little tips so people can find things out. So if you go to the NOC 2021, okay, this is one location, we'll start here. This is where you can determine what basically a stenographer, what it the position looks like in Canada to see how it relates to yours. Now, we've seen a ton of, of busyness here with the 2021. So sometimes when I try to log in here, it takes forever. Okay, let's go here. We're going to search up the job title. Okay, let's just type in st stenographer and just see here. Okay, so here is court reporters, medical transcriptionists, and this is stenographers here. So we'll take this one, and then what I'm looking for is to see if there's any regulation associated with it. So I skip actually past the duties, court reporter, medical transcriptionist, and I go down here. So to be a court reporter, completion of secondary school, and then it says completion of a college or other program in court reporting is usually required. And the chartered shorthand reporter certificate may be required for court reporters. Okay, so these are some of the specific requirements when it comes to law. So, um, but ultimately there is also the job bank. And I think anyone who wants to learn anything about occupations or work in Canada, um, the, the labor shortages in a particular area, the wages associated with it, you can go here as well. And you can go to, you can go to labor market information. And so if I want to go to outlook reports here, I can click on this and then I go here and I can see that this, uh, is 12, 110. So if I copy that. I can punch that right into here and it will pull up transcriber, whatever court monitor, court reporter, doesn't matter. We'll do that. And then when we pull this up, it tells us what the labor outlook is for this position in Canada. And it breaks it down by region. So you can see here that there's not a lot of data on this stuff. Um, in Nova Scotia, it's kind of a three star, which is, you know, it means that there's probably about the right number of current people that are looking for positions um, and the number of job openings are roughly equivalent to it. You can see as we go down to the other regions, New Brunswick is three star. Uh, Quebec is undetermined. I guess they just don't have enough data to really determine. Um, Ontario is moderate as well, three star. Let's see what it is in Alberta if I can find. Manitoba is good, so there's a better chance of getting a job as a stenographer there. Saskatchewan's very good. If you want to go to Saskatchewan, there's going to be jobs for you because there's more positions open than people are to fill them. And then Alberta, it's moderate as well. So you can see it's really driven by province. And, um, and so if you look at British Columbia, I just skipped through that. That's also four out of five, which is not bad. So those are some tools and resources that you can use when you're trying to figure out you know, what's going on. And then other than that, it really comes down to looking at what the requirements are for jobs uh, when people are posting. Do you need those specific um, requirements that, uh, that the, if I just jump back here, that are alluded to right here? You know, are they actually looking for the CSR um, certificate? Or is there college or other programming um, that you would have been required to take in order to, to work in that capacity. So 
Anyways, whether, and then you can see, uh, you'd mentioned law, but then obviously medical transcriptionists and things like that are also set out in here. So those are some sources for you, which normally I don't talk about that, but hey, this does go part and parcel with Express Entry in particular, because many, many people are wondering whether or not um, their work experience is in demand, or if they do have work experience, can they even work in that occupation when they're in Canada? So that's kind of where we're at. Okay, let's see here. Uh, okay, Soraya is in Richmond Hill. Welcome, welcome, Soraya. And Talis, it's great to have you. Um, thank you as well for being here and joining me. Uh, let's see who else we have here. A couple more shout outs. We've got Dahlia, who's in Hamilton, Ontario. Mary, I don't know that flag. Mary, uh, is it Africa? Somewhere in Africa, maybe. Um, uh, Mary, you're very welcome. Very, very welcome. Let's see who else we've got here. And uh, Messi is, says, hi, Mark. Hello to you as well. Okay, let's jump back and let's answer a few more questions today. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. We'll go to the next one. Okay, Ida says, hey, Mark, I received my EOR and uh, submit my documents yesterday. Want to say big thanks to you and your amazing team. Love you guys. Thanks so much, Ida. I really appreciate that. I actually think I have one of these. Let's see. Oh, it's a delayed, a delayed applause. <laughs> Thanks so much. And good luck. Keep us posted. All right. Um, Fernando says, currently driving through Regina, nice and sunny. Oh, that's awesome, Fernando. It is definitely a beautiful day. In fact, I will be ending this live stream right a little bit before 11 o'clock Mountain Time and then I have a team strategy meeting with the firm. And then I'm going to be taking my mother up to Calgary uh, for a, an appointment with an eye surgeon. So I guess it runs in the family, eye surgeries. But I'm going to be taking her up there. So um, we're, we're going to be racing to get up there at 3 o'clock. It's about a 2-hour and 15-minute drive from my, my home here in Lethbridge up to Calgary. And I also want to give a big, big uh, shout out. Um, oh, wrong one right here to this one here, our website. If you search now for, let's see if we can find healthy immigration law. <laughs> finally, I've got it sorted out. Finally, finally. And if you, <laughs> if you look over here, <laughs> you can see how the clicks are down, the impressions are down. Why? Because we've set up our office in Calgary. We have our, our office address in Calgary now. And, um, and so uh, we, all we did was just switch our Google reviews to this address. And then guess what? Google blocked us apparently for breaching the community standards. I didn't know what it was, but my goodness, we've been working for a full month, you guys, one whole month to get our firm website back up and searchable again. Absolutely infuriating, drives me crazy, but we're now up and running. So people can now leave Google reviews and they can find us. And uh, we're the office. And if people do want to meet with us, it's still by appointment. Um, and we still do a lot of the work virtually. There's no need to come down. But we do have the ability now to meet with clients in person if they want to connect with us. So all the appointments and everything, you can, you can schedule them right here on the site. And when you click on that, it will take you right to, let's see if it opens up here. Yes, it does. It takes us to our booking page where you can schedule an appointment based on the type of consultation that you're looking for. So there we go. All right. So I thought you guys would, uh, yeah, be interested to, to know that. I can't tell you how grateful I am because we've gone a whole month without people being able to search for our site, especially all of the awesome blog posts. Alicia just did one just recently on changes to the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program. We just had a great consult with a, a couple from Ukraine who are looking at permanent residence programs and, and the, uh, the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program is absolutely one that is the best. I also wanna slide back here and point out the podcast. If you guys have not subscribed either on um, the Spotify or uh, through the, the I, um, Apple podcast, You've got to come over here and and connect in. Igor and I have started a new series as well on the podcast. This one is the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Quet program. Definitely connect in. And then before that, you'll see we have business immigration series. Alicia and I 
are recording these ones fast and furious. They're all about the foreign worker program, working in Canada, all the number of options there. It's ideal for anyone who's looking to work in Canada just to get a better understanding. And then of course, we have our impossible trivia, the Canadian, impossible Canadian trivia that you have to come in and play along and see how well you do. Alicia is our reigning champ. Man, it has been really tough to, <laughs> to, to beat her. She is like working us all. So definitely come and check that out. And if you haven't subscribed, do it. You can listen to it while you're traveling. All right. So that's just some of the stuff we've got going on here in the firm. So it's absolutely great um, uh, you know, to just get you guys connected and know that there's not just video, but there's just about everything. Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> Dana says, what do we do if IRCC officer made an error in the date of birth and the work permit? I can't apply for social insurance. No, well, you can apply still. You can. Um, it depends on where the error occurred. You can apply to get the work permit changed. So there is a mechanism in place. Um, for example, we've had a work permit that was issued improperly in Calgary, and we were able to go back and and uh, and get that corrected. Toronto also has an ability, the airport there, depending on where you got the work permit, um, to get those things corrected. But Dana, hopefully, whoever helped you to get your work permit will will um, you know knows about that stuff. I sure hope so. If they don't, then you use the wrong representative. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a mechanism in place, and and otherwise, there's a place that you can make a get a correction made on the permit that you can send into IRCC. Let's see if we can pull it up here. Uh, let's see if we can pull up the actual instructions here. So just give me a second. Okay, here we go. I'll show you this one right here. So this is where you go. So it's, it's a request to amend a record of landing, confirmation of permanent residence, or valid temporary resident documents form. So when you click on here, uh, this is where you go, and this is the application that you submit to actually get your work permit changed. But it's not going to be a big deal for your social insurance number, but if it happened right away, um, if you want, I can help to fix this, but hopefully whoever did the work permit for you, um, you know, they would do this and, and correct it without charging you. I would, I would, you'd need to book a consult with me through our firm website um, right here. And all you have to do is just click on speak to a lawyer and then you can come right down here and book a consult with me right here. So there is options available, um, but hopefully whoever helped you to get that work permit in the beginning, Dana, can help you to correct that. Okay, Ross says, what can you say? Temporary resident approvals are pouring, yet PR slots seem to be very competitive. So not all TRVs can get PR. What's Canada's plan for this? Good question, Ross. I don't have an answer for this. You know, not everybody, and this is the thing, not everybody who comes to study in Canada is going to be able to apply for permanent residence. It's just not possible. It's not designed for every international student who gets a postgrad to be able to apply for permanent residence. Uh, there just are not enough spots. Ultimately, there's room that they have to make for refugees, for family class, for, um, you know, for startup visas and things like that. Other PR programs, um, all of those things play a role in, um, in basically what, uh, you know, the levels plans that the government makes. So no, I, they're just, you have to assume. So not all TRVs and can get PR. And remember, when you're talking about temporary resident visas, you know, those TRs, temporary resident visas, actually a visitor visa. Uh, temporary resident applications are ones like study permits, work permits, things like that. So yeah. Okay. Um, Fernando says, if I renew my passport, can I travel to the US and come back with my new passport and my valid visa and my old passport? Yeah, you can do that. You can. Um, let's see. But uh, Fernando, anytime, and I I'm going to stop and just make sure I don't get too far ahead of myself here understand that there all of the rules for admissibility still apply. So can you travel to the US and come back with your new passport? Um, if you have that new passport and it's in your hand and you're traveling abroad and you're coming back, yes, the visa isn't invalidated that's in your old passport. But uh, the, the question that I have for you is with your valid visa in your old passport, why are you getting a new passport? Is the old passport expiring? And with your old visa, um, is that old visa also, was it a single entry? Was it a multiple entry? 
what was the expiry date on that visa? So let me backtrack quickly and say there's a number of factors. And I guess I shouldn't say you can just travel because that's not the case. In fact, Fernando, I recommend that you book a consult so that we can sort through that. Um, but uh, yeah, the, generally speaking, uh, it all comes down to whether or not that visa is still valid. And um, yeah, uh, now that I look at your question, I'm not sure how that would all fit in, Fernando. So before you ever, ever think about traveling, just book a consult and let's sort it out. Okay. All right. Let's see what's next here. Okay. So Talis says after GC key, but before ITA. Okay. After GC key, but before ITA. Okay. I'm assuming express entry profile. Uh, at FSW, we have to answer questions about the city of work study. Yes. If I'm working from home, the answer would be where I live or the company's city. Um, have to answer questions about the city of work study. If I'm working from home, the answer would be where I live or the company's. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're talking about like remote work. It's always where you live. If you put the address of work as being in your personal history, and this is this is where like when you're when you're completing your work history section, the the location of work, um, if you're working remote, it it should be listed as where you are living out of your home, and then I put you know, remote work in parentheses by uh, the title um, of the of the work, you know, the job that you're doing. That's how I deal with it. And of course, where do I talk about that? And I think <laughs> I try to make this as transparent as I possibly can. Let's reload this page here. This is the Canadian Immigration Institute. There's links that are all in the description below, wherever you're watching. And if you scroll down, you can see that this hasn't yet been updated but we are going to have our next masterclass for express entry here, the 20th. Let's see, when are we going to do that? Let me just take a quick peek here. We are going to be doing that. I know Igor and I were just talking about the 22nd through the 25th. So of this month, we will have um, this express entry will be um, uh, May 22nd through the 25th. Igor is just going to update this, but it is, yeah, it's awesome. This course is full of every possible thing that you could ever need to help you navigate your way through express entry. And there are an absolute ton of um, alumni that have come through this course and I love these masterclasses. So absolutely, whenever you have any question related to express entry, seriously consider, obviously hiring us, we can help you, but, uh, but consider the DIY course. Okay, uh, let's see what's next here. Okay, Igor gave me a thumbs up. So he's going to be changing the um, <laughs> the EE course. I bet by the time we're done here, he'll have it changed. Okay, you know, one other thing that we also, um, people were really worried about was whether or not there was going to be rounds of invitations, right? And so if we slide over here and take a look, I think most people are realized now that on April the 26th, last week, we did have another draw. And if we look at the... Um, the previous rounds here, you can see that they have, like they didn't skip a beat. So they've kept, they kept with the draws. And so that's really, really positive for many people because a lot of people were thinking, oh my goodness, what is the strike gonna do? So fortunately they kept going business as usual, which is, which is fantastic. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Um, okay, Michael says, hello, Mark. I will need to provide my proof of income as a Canadian relative. Not sponsorship. Is investment pension income good enough for the purpose? I do not have payroll income right now. Okay. Um, proof of income as a Canadian relative. Not sponsorship. I'm trying to figure out where you're providing proof in what context. Because um, there's obviously spells of sponsorship. If you're a sponsor, if you are... If you are um, Proof of income as a Canadian relative. I, I'm not sure in what context you're asking for this. Um, huh. But generally speaking, whether it's Express Entry or any other program, investment or pension income, I don't, I don't consider that ever as being enough. Um, the reality is when it comes to the actual um, proving of any funds, they want to see that it's liquid and available. The challenge with pension and investment income is that it's not available to actually support, you actually have to take it out. And often there's penalties and things like that. So rarely will IRCC accept pure investment slash pension income. It needs to be liquid, liquidated. But uh, um, yeah, uh, Mitchell, I, I don't know. 
the context here, which is always challenging when we're talking about individual stuff, but I'll just show you, um, I'll give you an example. One of my favorite places to go is the IRCC completeness check. And if we go here, we'll see, and we scroll down to proof of funds, okay? And then we go here, you'll see, this is, this is where it's important for you to understand. So, <clears throat> so you are to provide an official letter from one or more institutions that lists all current bank and investment accounts, as well as outstanding debts, credit cards, debts, and loans. So you can see here that um, when you're trying to prove this, um, they want to see the account number, the date it was opened, current balance, and as well as the average balance for the past six months. And uh, so many people, when they're going through this process and are, and are trying to provide funds, you have to be able to demonstrate that these funds are readily available. So this is the, this is the proof of funds for the purposes of the completeness check. There's also instructions that they give on um, a standalone page right here. And this is where I want to dive in a little bit deeper just to show you about this proof of funds. So one thing, as of April 25th, 2023, you guys, which is just only like a week ago, the funds went up. So they've increased the minimum proof of funds that you need uh, in order to go through the express entry process. Um, I'm just going to see. I wonder if they've updated the actual proof. Um, just give me a second here. Uh, do, 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 how much money do you need? What we accept. Okay. Okay. Yes. So here, you must prove that you can legally access the money when you arrive. Here, when you arrive, you can't use equity on real estate. Uh, you can't borrow the money from another person. You must be able to use the money to pay the costs. Um, let's just see. I rarely look at this stuff because I, I don't pay too much attention to the policy. I focus mostly on, mostly on the law. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. How much money should you bring? Order. Yeah. So uh, this, when it comes to the not using um, the, the, the actual investment or pension income, um, this all comes down to the readily having it readily available to be able to be used. I wish they would specifically state, hey, investment income that is not um, available. Let's just see here. Uh, all right. Okay. Yes. So you just need there we go. You need to make sure that you focus on the fact that the funds have to be available to settle in Canada. And uh, for the other reasons why I explained, if you're not ultimately, um, uh, yeah, if, you, if you're not ultimately able to pull that money out without a penalty um, or readily access it, then it's not going to be something that you're going to want to use. And officers have the discretion to refuse. Okay. Simran says, I have an express entry profile under CEC, but still... It is asking for funds. So filled in the minimum amount and now they change the minimum amount. Do I need to change it or not? So this is a part of the system. So whenever you enter a profile or you enter, if you get an ITA and you're completing this information, they're always going to continue to ask you for money. And I'll be honest, it doesn't matter what you put in there if you're drawn under the CEC. So if you say you've got a profile under CEC, um, it doesn't matter. They're still going to ask for how much money you have, even though you're exempt. And then the, the response is, um, in, when you get your ITA, uh, you're just going to indicate a simple little statement, which I talk about in my course, that simply says, please note I've been drawn under the CEC, and therefore I do not need to provide settlement funds. That's how I deal with that, Simran. But no, they don't, um, uh, they, they, you know, in some cases I've had people just put zero down if they're CEC. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't impact um, on anything if you're going through CEC. Okay, uh, Jonas says, I want to know if applications are processed according to a queue and therefore according to the date of submission or that processing is done on a basis specific to each file. I'm an FSW applicant. First in, first out. That's what they say. So um, there is a, uh, as they transitioned and have been trying to triage and, and get things going through faster, there are certain files that are, are kind of like a green bin file, they call it. So if your file has no issues, it looks straightforward, it's easy for them to see you're eligible and, uh, and can approve, be approved, then it goes to a fast track system where you'll see it gets processed quicker than say someone who has dependents overseas. Um, you're an FSW, but who has dependents or if there is any kind of 
um, police clearance issue or medical issue or things like that, um, or even things like self-employed work experience sometimes is harder to assess by an officer. So sometimes those will take longer. So in principle, it's first in, first out. Um, but in reality, if any app, a part of your application needs additional review or, or, or even if you're coming from different countries as well, the first in, first out sometimes will apply to that type of a situation as well, where maybe it takes longer in India than it would take coming from the United Kingdom, for instance. So there's a lot of different factors, but generally speaking, it is first in, first out. Okay, uh, Sana says, Mark, my AOR is um, March the 30th, 2023. Um, proof of funds have been updated to 13,757. Do people like me already having applications and process need to update their proof of funds? Yes, yes, you do. So at the time in which you land, you need to show that you have those minimum settlement funds, Sana. And so, yes, I would. I would, um, I would update it <coughs> and, um, and just through a web form. I would just say, hey, please note, I have those funds available. Here's, um, uh, and, and ultimately, here's an updated proof of it. Um, some people will just wait and won't say anything, but I've seen IRCC come back and then ask them to provide the, the proof of the updated uh, settlement funds. So just to, for those of you who are just wondering what we're kind of referring to here, like I said, for an individual applicant, oh, let's go up, up to the top here. Da, 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 da. Oh, which one am I on here? I think I'm on the wrong one. Oh, I'm in the completeness check. This one, here's the winner. So if we scroll down here, you'll see that it was updated. Like we said, 13,757, that's the new amount. So if you were, you know, low 13,000s, you know, before they updated these funds, then when you're submitting your application, you do have to demonstrate that you've got those additional funds. So yeah, I would, Santa, I would. Parvinder, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. All right, let's see here. Um, okay, great, Dahlia. Great, great, Dahlia. She's got a question about spousal sponsorship. I applied March 14th, 2022. Everything is done now. My application is in Jordan. I'm on office. It's almost 14 months now. Is that normal? Yes, it is. Short answer, yes, it is. Uh, Verinder over on LinkedIn. Hello, great to have you connecting in. And we've got Lang, who's in the Philippines. Hello to you. Okay, David says, David Bonilla says, hey, Mark, if I got a notification, hi, Mark, if I got a notification of interest from Ontario under the skilled trade stream, do I have to be tied to a company or do I just have to prove my years of experience in the trade? David, that is a consult, my friend. So I recommend that you book a consult uh, so that we can discuss that in depth because I'll need a whole lot more information about that. Okay, um, I see that I do have a super here. That's shifted through. Okay, so Ali says, um, okay, AOR March 17th, tracker says CEC biometric medical completed, eligibility not started, background in process, says we are checking if admissible to Canada. Is my application IPT stage? <laughs> okay, Ali here, let me just explain something. I worked as a former immigration officer. So I was, I was involved in the old FOSS system, um, the GCMS when it was created, which is the one we're using right now. And never in the entire time that I was even working as an officer did I pay any attention to these stages. And let me tell you why. The reason is because those stages can be completed in a matter of days. So just because someone's at an IP2 stage or they're, you know, uh, whatever level that they're at, um, officers can close that gap in one day. They can literally take your application from start to finish in one day, go through all those stages, such that whatever stage you're, you're at, it just zips through. Whereas other people, because of other factors, who knows, the workload of the officer could be sitting at this IP2 stage or, or whatever stage it's at, uh, background check stage. It could be hung up there for a variety of reasons. So I never pay any attention to it because for the simple reason that it's not really a predictor of anything. It isn't, not of processing, at least as far as I'm concerned. Now the government is looking at trying to update their uh, the processing so that you can actually track it a little bit better. And I think you guys have seen that there's new portals for this. Uh, so let's see if I can pull it up here. Just looking to see if they actually have their um, 
their tracker alive. I think it's this one here. Let's flip back. So this here, Express Entry, check your application status. So this application status tracker, let's open this in a new tab here. Yes. So when you log in here, you can actually get a better idea of where you're at within the process. Now, I don't know if, if you've actually done this or if, um, uh, it, you know, if you're just kind of guessing or what it is, Ali, but I recommend that you check that out. I'm actually going to see if I can. Let's see here. I'm going to go to our actual live here. I'm going to stop this, pause it, and then I'm going to post this alley right in, um, right on the page here in the group, at least the YouTube, because I think that's where you're tuning in from. Okay, so I just posted it, Ali, in the the chat for the YouTube channel, uh, the link to take you to the, the basically the, I keep pushing, sorry, this one here, <laughs> I keep pushing the wrong button. So that's where you can get there. All right. Let's keep zipping through here. We got good questions come. Um, let's see here. Jump back down. Uh, okay, Talas is it Ghana? Great. Okay, that's the flag. Awesome. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. Uh, okay. Messi says a eleven point two appears met. An analyst recommendation is recommend pass. Is it still possible for eligibility to fail? Well. Not unless there's something else. <laughs> so remember, you can, uh, like, if, if eligibility is passed, then I'm not even sure why you're asking this question, Messi. Is there something that you know is wrong and, and you're hoping that they overlooked it or missed it? Um, but yeah, when the recommendation is passed, that means that the assessment is done and that they feel you meet the eligibility. And if you were to request the GC, uh, the GC notes, the uh, do an ATIP, you would see that they the rec when it says recommended pass, then that means that they've actually done the assessment. And sometimes you can even see how they're assessing work history and the other parts of the express entry process. So yeah, that's a good sign. Okay, Vera says, hey Mark, please shed more light on LMIA to support PR application. Okay, so basically how it works, there are three distinct types of labor market impact assessments. One is a permanent one. It's only used to support permanent residents. A company will post advertisements for the position. They will field the responses. And if there's no Canadian or permanent resident that's qualified or available to do the position, they'll submit an application to ESDC who will then assess it. And if accepted, they will approve a permanent LMIA. That permanent LMIA will then be used and your name, Vera, will be put on there to support your permanent residence. In other words, to get the extra points, the extra 50 points or 200 points, whatever, respectively, um, you're, depending on the level of your occupation, towards express entry or maybe one of the PNPs. But at this stage, um, that's option one, what I call a permanent LMIA. Option two is a dual purpose. So it's used for both permanent residence and for you to use it to apply to get a work permit to come and work in Canada while you're waiting for that um, that uh, permanent resident application to be processed. And number three is just a work permit LMIA, which is just designed to support the issuance of a work permit. And there are some nuances that are distinct between dual purpose and a regular work permit, uh, a regular LMIA that supports a work permit. One being transition plans. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of de details on that, but that's essentially how it works. So unless you have, you've got a company who's actually gone through the process and obtained the LMIA, and there are samples with all of this stuff in my Express Entry course. I have a ton of... I keep pushing the wrong button here. Sorry, guys. When you go in to learn more... Oh, Igor's already got it updated. Look at that. I knew he would. <clears throat> so if you scroll down here and you look at the contents of the course, I have tons of doc information, videos. Like, it, like I always repeat to you guys, there's over 10 hours of content plus the four hours of Masterclass. Um, you know, when you think the fact that I charge about $300 for a 25 minute consult, you know, that's about 600 an hour times four is about $2,400. And for all intents and purposes, all the questions that you have possible that you could ask about express entry. Um, I have four hours of masterclass where you can post your questions and get answers all for that one flat fee price of what is it? I think it's 350 us is what we charge. I can't remember what we charge for our express entry course. What is it here? Yeah, 347, depending upon which 
uh, region you're in, the tax will be applied. But you know, 364, um, yeah, 364, 35 US is is what the the cost is. Anyways, but consider that's that's almost the cost of just a 25 minute consult. But you get all of this other information. Um, yeah, it's designed to help you get through and navigate. You'll see here that I have in in the context of all of the documents in module six, I have a specific section on offers of employment and built within here are sample, sample LMIAs. And so it, well, whatever, I'll, I'll show you guys here. Let's just, let's just go in as if I'm logging in as you. So I've got a bunch of other courses here, spousal express entry. Okay, let's go into the express entry course. And then I'm gonna go right to module six here. And then I'm gonna go to, and each of these has their own video instructions. This one's like 17 minutes long. And then on the right, you'll see I've got tons of samples. So let's see, we've got a sample LMIA. Let's see what we have here. I think this should open up in here. Good, okay. So this one here, you can see, says this is, this is to inform you that the ESDC has completed the processing of your application. It determined that the hiring of the foreign national in the specified occupation um, is likely to have a positive or neutral impact, okay? So this one here is a regular one. Um, and if you go, if you scroll down here, this is where it has all the information for the position. And then this is where your information is listed on here. Now, sometimes companies don't give this specifically to you because they might have multiple positions on here. Um, so that's an example of one. Let's go back and let's see. I know that I have um, a permanent one here as well. There it is. This is the one. So this one is what a permanent LMIA looks like. So you can see here. It's completed processing of your labor market impact assessment. Um, it's a positive decision based on the information provided in your LMA application. This job offer may be valid to support an application to an economic immigration program subject to the express entry system. Okay, so that's the difference. So this one is specifically permanent. Now on the surface, it looks very similar. So there's more information there, but ultimately the annex is very similar. You can see it has all the information, uh, the, the occupation, and then this page, the same um, details, background information on the, the work conditions. And then as we scroll down further here, we have Annex B, which also lists the, the, the name of the foreign worker. So there you go. Everything you wanted to know and more <laughs> about the, the LMIA process. And I guess I should also say that um, you know, when, if you're looking for instructions and and man, I keep pushing the wrong one, generic uh, information about this, you can see that I actually have express entry, the postgrad 18 month study permit, spousal, LMIA course for high wage positions. This is not This is one that's for work permits, but the information in here is, um, is super comprehensive and it talks about all aspects of the the program, recruiting, preparing and submitting your application, employer compliance obligations. This part has been updated slightly because now it's filed online um, and I'm going to be updating this, but this also goes over a ton of information. Um, yeah, with respect to the LMA process. All right. Okay, we got some good, uh, good questions here today and uh, we're taking some time to get some good answers. Okay. <laughs> yes, Mary says Ghana. That's awesome. Okay. Um, okay. Ravi says my biometrics in India is done. What are the next steps for Express Entry FSW? Well, if there's nothing more that they're asking for, if you've got your medical done, um, then realistically they could go through and complete all steps to the point of a passport request. Literally, if there's nothing else that they need to do. So simple as that as long as your medical and police clearance are done. Okay. Um, okay. Santa says my medical and, and biometrics are updated in my account. Okay. That's, that's great. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. And lots of people are kind of stuck in this position. Cool. Jeet. Hey, Mark, worried about my application. I haven't received any notification on my account since I submitted my de uh, my demand on the 13th of January called IRCC. It's in Central and Takeoffs. What to do? I have no clue, Kuljeet. I don't know when you would have submitted the application, how long it's been in the queue. Understand that processing times can be very, very high. And if there's any time that they needed to request anything from you, you can throw the processing times out the door. So, um, you know, there's options for... 
uh, you know, if there, if there truly isn't any, hasn't been responses for like well beyond the processing times, then you can potentially file things like mandamus applications or judicial review. So be aware um, that those things are possible, but ultimately, yeah, I'd need a whole lot more information. Kuljeet, I recommend that you book a consult. Okay, uh, Sneha says, hey Mark, um, a work permit is expiring October the 23rd. Is it better to opt in the post-grad extension or apply separately on August or September to get maximum extension? Do you know what? Take what's in front of you. I never, ever want to hesitate. Take what's in front of you. And ultimately, um, you know, you could always wait and delay it and then submit it, you know, manually uh, as it's closer, your work permit is getting closer to expiring. It would give you more time, um, but I never want to delay. If I have something that's available to me, I like to take advantage of it. Okay, Mohammed says, what's the impact of, uh, of US visa refusal for administrative processing on PR application? Well, did you disclose it? As long as you disclosed it, then I can't see any impact. Um, it's only when you fail to disclose a US visa refusal that you, um, that you can be found to have misrepresented yourself. Now, with that being said, was there other things associated with that visa refusal? Um, you know, was there other uh, enforcement action taken to you? Were you in the U.S. and then got it refused because of, you know, some other, um, you know, uh, breach of U.S. immigration code? Um, yeah, but generally speaking, if you've had a visa refusal, let's use an example. Uh, you apply to, to go visit the U.S. and it's refused. Well, if you disclose that in the context of a permanent resident application, it shouldn't have any effect on your Canadian application. But if you didn't and Canada finds out, you can be barred for five years for misrepresentation. Talis, you're very welcome. Okay, um, Kevin says, is it possible to work remotely from Toronto for a Montreal-based employer and apply under CEC? Are there risks of rejection because of ties to Quebec or they will ask for explanation if needed? Thanks. You have to show or demonstrate that you intend to reside outside the province of Quebec. If you're already residing and, and living in Toronto, like you truly are, and you've got your a lease agreement, you've got, you know, whatever else going on there, then, um, you know, the officers have to have grounds to refuse the application. There's no, there's no, um, on its face, there's no prohibition uh, to work for a Montreal based employer. But I'll, I'll tell you, Kevin, I don't take any chances with this stuff. Once you're a permanent resident, then you can make whatever decisions you want to make. But if you're living in, um, you know, outside of, of Toronto, that's going to be a whole lot. Sorry, if you're living outside of Montreal, it's going to be a whole lot better than if you're working for that same Montreal-based employer and you're living in Quebec. So um, the, the regulations require that you demonstrate an intention to reside outside the province of Quebec. So in your situation, um, yeah, that's a pretty strong indicator that you don't intend to live in Quebec, uh, even if you are working remotely. But understand, officers can always ask questions. They can always bring things up and say, hey, I think you're actually, um, you are going to live in, in Quebec because you're working full time for a Quebec based employer. You know, they could always try to make that argument. But, you know, I think even your situation is defensible. Although with my clients, I advise them to not have any ties with Quebec. Then there's no doubt. There's no question. There's no room for an officer to make a decision, even if that decision might be unreasonable or wrong. And then you have to challenge it later. Okay, um, Hussein says, I've got an ECA only for my highest degree, which is a PhD. Do I have to upload my master's and bachelor's degrees and transcripts in my application post-ITA knowing that they date for more than 10 years? Um, so the, the whole thing with that is, what did you put in your profile? If you put something in your profile, then I tend to include the, the other documents. But when you're completing your study history, um, if you only have an ECA for your PhD, then... <clears throat> then um, uh, like you're not, obviously you're getting maximum points for that. So uh, all, if you if you do it correctly, you can remove it and just keep it simple with, uh, with your PhD. Um, but you're right, after 10, if everything is older than 10 years, then it's not going to necessarily need to be in your personal history either. But uh, there's no harm in listing the other education in there and just saying you don't have an ECA for it. Um, but uh, like I said, it depends on what you put in your profile, Hussein. If you put in your profile, I tend to just include it if you have it. If you don't and you just have the PhD, then a well-worded and carefully worded letter of explanation can be enough. Um, yeah, with as long as you've got your ECA, your degree, transcripts and everything for a PhD. Um, yeah. 
Okay, um, let's see here. What do we got next here? Okay, so I see Natish saying here, <clears throat> hey Mark from Vancouver, still waiting for my question to be answered, thanks. Some of them don't show up in my system until after I've gone live. So Natish, I see no other questions in my feed, so you might want to, um, uh, at least I don't see. Let me see if there's anything else in the actual YouTube, Natish, because I don't see it anywhere here. Oh, Natish, you posted yours right at the very beginning. Okay. All right. Close this. Let's see. Um, okay, this is kind of a long question here, Natish. I don't know if I can do this one. Let's see if we can do it here. Yeah, sometimes when people post their questions uh, early, uh, before the, the feed goes live, I don't always see them. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, so Natish says, I'm on a closed work permit and have a valid TRV. Okay, uh, sitting at 42, hoping to get my IT in the next draw. Can I travel out of Canada for a couple of months after submitting the eCoper? Will it be a problem once I'm back? Uh, let's assume I submit my file in June and then I'm outside of Canada and then I got an invite for electronic coper uh, in case can income back to Canada, submit my docs and go, okay, I will never ever tell you to leave, Natesh. Not in that situation, no. I will never ever tell you to, to leave and then in the context of waiting for your application to be finalized, uh, especially if you're inside Canada. <clears throat> I just won't, it's as simple as that. Um, it may be possible for you to come back and then and then submit the eCoper when you return. That may be possible. Um, but for me and my purposes, I never, ever advise my clients to leave when they're in the final stages of their PR because anything can happen. What if you get sick and then you can't come back and then your whole PR application is 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 undermined because of it or something crazy happens. You get in an accident and then they charge you with some criminal offense like on your ve in a vehicle accident or or you you decide to have a drink at night and you get a DUI and like I just you know obviously those things can can also impact your your if you're inside Canada but there's too many variables so no I'll never never advise you to do that okay let's see what's next we've got just a couple more minutes here before we wrap this up um let's see Oh, Talis is looking forward to the next EE course. Yeah, and this is one thing I want to let you guys know as well. Within the course itself, I highly, highly recommend, um, <clears throat> as we slide over here, that if you're going to do it, like subscribe early, because then you've got time to work through all of those courses, all of those modules. Let's see, I'm trying to flip around here. I've got too many pages. This one, yeah. You Because if you subscribe now <clears throat> and take advantage of it, you can then you then have time now before we do the master class to go through, take your time, build up all of the questions that you could possibly have. And when we do the master class, right now it's from 4 to 5 p.m. Mountain Time, and some people are working, but that's totally fine because in the course we have um, a community group where you can post all your questions, and I make sure that every single question gets answered. Not a single question goes unanswered. And uh, like I said, when you think of what I charge uh, for a consult, which is basically about $600 an hour for the $350 US that you pay for this, you get 10 hours of specific content, tons of video instruction on every aspect of the express entry process, including all of those um, four uh, separate hours, four days in a row, May 22nd to the 25th for the master classes. So now is the time if you're thinking about taking the course to do it. And yeah, I just can't encourage you enough to uh, to consider doing that. All right. Um, okay, Gladys says, hey, Mark, IRCC re recently updated their proof of funds. I've, yes, they did. I've already received an ITA, so my EE seems locked. I only see view form on my e-profile. How do I update my proof of funds and my express name to avoid in ineligibility? Okay, so if you've already received your ITA, um, um, I guess you haven't submitted it at this stage. One, Gladi, I encourage you to subscribe to the course or retain us to help you. But ultimately, when it comes to amending or, or changing things in your EAPR, when you're completing it, you can just change the number in there. It's not a problem. You said you've received your ITA. So um, what you put in the previous one was, was locked. Yes, your profile is. But when you're completing the EAPR section, just up, update it with the current amount. No problems at all. Okay, um, 
All right, Patel says I have an old medical, which is less than five years. So if IRCC will ask me to do medicals again, do I have to do again? Yeah, if they asked you, you have to, regardless of whether or not you benefit from the public policy right now that's valid until the fall, essentially, where people don't have to do new medicals if, they've, if their old ones are within five years and they were clear. There's no issues with them. But if they come back and ask, Patel absolutely have to. Okay, Salim, good to see you over in Karachi. Thanks for connecting in. Um, uh, Soraya says, hey, Mark, have you ever had federal skilled trades live or planning to have one? Well, understand the federal skilled trade program is not much different than what we're talking about now in terms of express entry. It all just comes down to eligibility. And the eligibility for the federal skilled trade program is pretty straightforward. So uh, Soraya, ultimately, when it comes to the federal skilled trade, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. And if you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer those. Okay. Um, okay. This is a great question. Fernando says, he says, can I go to the border? I would never advise anyone to go to the border. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Um, and apply for a new work permit since the original one was missing the employer's name. Tried to have it amended in Ottawa, but was refused. They advised applying for a new one. What you're going to do if there is, um, so you, the work permit, if there was an error made on the work permit, um, it depends on how you're trying and what is what's trying to get amended. But if it's missing the employer's name, well, my question is, do you apply for an employer specific or was it an open work permit? If you can clearly show that it was uh, an error and like a typo error, that's one thing. But if they didn't, you know, if you expected to have an employer specific one, then there must have been something that was missed. But I strongly encourage you to book a consult, Fernando. Okay, Dahlia, you're very welcome. See if we can wrap up just uh, our last ones right here. Uh, hi, Mark. If my result evaluation comes back from Wes's master's was unrecognized, can I still use it for express entry? No, you can't. It needs to actually be recognized. I recommend that you consider maybe going through another educational credential assessment agency to see if they would. Um, can a visiting husband of an international student apply for a spousal open work permit when in Canada? If so, what are the chances of that person being granted the work permit? Well, you can, if they're here and you have an international student, you can prove you're married. They can absolutely apply for the spousal open work permit from within Canada. Um, we help our clients with, with that all the time. Um, if you do it correctly, it can work. Um, Rafiq says, for an outland applicant, what is my medical exam expires before getting COPER? Will it mandatory to redo the medical? Yeah, more often than not, they will, although they do have the discretion to not require it. Okay, Mohammed says, government officer in Pakistan, Canada, visitor visa refused 2019, 2023, visited Spain, US, UA, Turkey, to do, okay, a, val, a valid US, I have applied Canada plus April 2020, what are chances? <laughs> Book a consult, Mohammed. <laughs> Book a consult. Um, okay, SFX, it's been a year, I'm in the pool, not code 11200, no luck so far, hang in there. Remember, your profile will expire after one year, so you'll need to re-enter it in. Um, Isla says, hey, Mark, how would an employment letter for code 63211 cosmetician only has one duty listed? Um, you just have to demonstrate that you've performed the, a substantial number of the main duties listed in the NOC. And so if the employment letter only has one duty, it comes down to whatever duties are listed on that uh, for the NOC code for 63211. And your job is to show that you've done a substantial number of those main duties, which is usually about 75%. In some cases, there's one duty listed, but it has a number of things in the one paragraph. I've seen that sometimes. So then I'll break down and show how I've done all the things in all of those, those single sentences that are, are all consolidated into one bullet point. Um, so it just, yeah, you just want to make sure that you're showing exactly what the knock says, that you've hit 75% of them. Okay. Uh, let's see. I, I'm just about out. Oh, thanks, Andy. Hey, good to see you. I'm going to give Andy a little, uh, a little applause here. <laughs> thanks, Andy. He says, hey, Mark, I'm an RCIC um, IRB, and I did your master class last year to supplement my knowledge. I just want to see how great your class is, even for someone that has gone through training such as me. Thank you, Andy. I really appreciate that. What Andy man, I keep pushing the wrong direction, is the express entry course right here. So this is the one that he took. And obviously everything that's in here, you can see Andy got CPD accreditation for it. So um, yes, Andy, thank you so much. That really means a lot. And 
hey, I can say how awesome the course is all I want. But at the end of the day, it's people like you, Andy, when you come and say, hey, I'm an immigration consultant. I took the course and it was great. It supplemented all the other training that I had and, and was super beneficial. So I, I really, really appreciate that. Okay, um, trying to get to some people maybe that I haven't answered questions for yet. Uh, Muhammad, I'm doing well. Thank you for everything, my friend. Um, uh, okay, I think it's live. I answered your question. I think I did. Let's see. Okay, yeah, I got it. Okay, so I answered one of your questions, Isla. <laughs> she says, I've been answering my questions multiple times and no answer. Okay, I think I got your question answered. Um, Okay, it says, hey, Mark, if I book consult with you, does your fee apply to future service? I may request from you, to, for example, help me with PR. Yes, if people book a consult with me and it's for permanent residents, okay, permanent residents, then I will, if they retain me within one week of that consult, I do credit the consult amount. So there you go. And that's a pretty good place to start off, uh, to end off with. So thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. Once again, this was another fantastic live uh, Express Entry Live, that is. Thank you for joining me. As always, this is your opportunity, and I don't know how many other places there are that offer uh, advice like, well, I should say immigration information like this, but I love it. If I could do this all day, this is what I would do. Now, I've got to jump over to a team meeting, but I want to thank everybody for joining in. The world is 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 righted now <laughs> with the strike over. We don't have to go through this insanity of what's going to happen but I wanna let you all know how much I appreciate everything that you do to support myself, uh, my law firm, Holthy Immigration Law. Um, <laughs> here we go, Holthy Immigration Law, that, that, you, that you do to support the Canadian Immigration Institute with all of our courses, and especially all, of the, all that you do to support us on our live channels like this one. Um, let's open it up here. Uh, the Canadian Immigration Institute. The YouTube channel has a ton of videos and we're just about at 50,000 subscribers. So please come on over here, click subscribe. I'd love to hit the 50,000 mark. That would be quite a milestone. That would be fun. And then remember that on our, on our firm website, we've got a ton of information here in our blogs that you can search on just about every uh, topic, timely topic that you could imagine. And then of course our podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast share it with everybody that you know, and come and play along in our impossible Canadian trivia. We'd love for you to do that, and you can check out those episodes, but these are coming fast and furious. And I guess the final thing I want to do is just slide over here, and I didn't do an official shout out for them today in the video today, but Journey is the sponsor for our podcast, and I want to thank Journey Business Plans for uh, just being such a, a great supporter of the channel and uh, and everything that we're doing. They do great work and there's uh, tons of resources, whether you're an immigration consultant, a lawyer, um, or just someone yourself who's looking at doing different things, starting up a company in Canada, or even an M&A firm. They do a lot of really, really good work. So go check them out. That's J-O-O-R-N-E-Y uh, dot C-A is their channel. All right. Thanks, guys. Great to have you joining me. Have a wonderful day and I'll see you tomorrow at noon with Alicia.